Hello. I am so tired. Less than 1% of my subscribers have been watching these videos, so I'm going to keep making them. Yes, for the first time, I will actually make part three of a trilogy. Not for the last time either, I promise. As usual, this is part of a series about my process working on my short film, The Sky Below. Please watch the previous two parts if you haven't already. It will not make much sense if you don't. Okay, so that shot of him looking up at the tower, that was pretty much the last thing I shot before I redressed my set for the final scene on the surface. For that shot, and a couple others like it, uh, I had to get my dad to help me suspend both tower halves sideways on the table. It's not a fully closed circle, uh, right? It's like, it's like that. Uh, so that meant we had to basically tie it to the ceiling with cables and eye hooks. I was like 90% certain it was going to collapse and cut my arms off, but that would be a small price to pay for a cinematic establishing shot. I realized in hindsight that I really should have taken more time to add detail to the halves of the tower. Um, I kept running into areas where Ainley just didn't have enough handholds, so I, I just kept animating him climbing up the same section of wall over and over again. Okay, so uh, this scene where he jumps for the vine is one of my favorites. Uh, in the storyboard, it was a lot less interesting. Um, there was only a handful of shots to convey what really should have been more intense. Um, he just sort of grabbed onto it and fell, but instead I leaned into the fact that he was running out of handholds and I made him jump for it. Instead of just like an accident, uh, now it's almost a leap of faith. So the vine rips free from the wall and he begins to fall, but then it wraps around his leg and very symbolically stops him. Uh, this is his point of no return. The green saved him from falling, uh, but in the process, he lost the lantern, and the last of the orange was consumed by the solemn. By the way, his lantern was built using a core of a Bionicle Technic pieces, and there's a little Lego Mixels joint on top. I've destroyed those pieces, they can never be used again now, so the comfort associated with the underground is gone now, and uh, without his light, he can never go back into the dark. The only way out is up. And with that, we've advanced to one of the final stages of the color script. Uh, all that's left is green and purple. Oh, and just a quick note. Um, I shoved a thick strand of aluminum wire into the middle of the vines in order to make it poseable. The vines and plants, by the way, are just like fake plastic stuff from a craft store. So then he reaches the highest section of the tower. It's narrower at the top, so I made it out of a trash can that I cut in half. I kept both halves so they'd fit together like puzzle pieces. For this wide shot of him beating the glass portal, I wasn't able to reach inside the trash can to animate him. So before I started, I also took a single frame of the fully closed cylinder. So when I animated him, I made sure to keep him within the borders of the lower half, uh, so then I could just like cut out the upper half and digitally stick it on top. For these close-ups through the glass, I also had to digitally layer the surface on top. The surface set piece was too heavy to attach to this setup, like I was literally just using cardboard boxes and duct tape to keep the trash can in place. Oh my gosh, it's getting hot in here. Don't like being sweaty. So in this scene, when the Solemn grabs him, uh, the tendrils wrapping around him aren't actually connected to the main mass of the Solemn. I knew it would be a lot harder to animate him with those connected to the thing, so uh, I just trimmed a bunch of spare pieces and wrapped them around his limbs and extended them back so it looked like they were attached. Uh, the, the glass smash effect was kind of difficult. I have very little experience with 3D animation or simulations or anything like that, and uh, After Effects isn't great at 3D at the best of times, so this effect took a lot of trial and error. Um, I'm still not perfectly happy with it, but it looks fine. Quick little interjection from future editing Charlie here. Initially, when he smashed the glass, the shards would just fall back down into the shaft with him. But a little ways into the editing process, I decided it would probably be cooler if they sort of floated up into the sky, because uh, that would sort of foreshadow what's about to happen. It would be a little more consistent with the, the physics I established. So that is why that is like that. That is all. In the storyboard, the scene of him climbing through the portal was just one shot, and it was going to be a cross-section kind of thing. Uh, but that turned out to be physically impossible. Um, so I broke it up into a few smaller shots that focus on just one thing at a time. Every shot of that took a few reshoots, but uh, in the end I got it looking right. At this point, uh, the color script is in its penultimate stage, uh, where green and purple were previously mixed together. Uh, now they're almost completely separated, with just small sections leaking into one or the other. The conflict between the surface and the underground has reached its climax, narratively speaking, and uh, that's reflected in the colors. There has been a lot of confusion about what exactly is going on when gravity flips out here. Uh, but, but that's fine by me. I, I never really intended to explain it within the film anyway. Uh, to viewers, it's really meant to be more allegorical than literal. It represents Ainley's reluctance to leave home and how he won't be able to survive on the surface if he's still hanging on to the underground. You know, like, literally hanging on to it. Visual metaphor, you know. So only when he lets go and takes his real leap of faith is he able to stand on the surface. I also have some, like, deep lore reasons for the gravity-flipping thing. It's, it's stuff involving, like, ancient gods and the laws of the universe this takes place in or whatever, but, like, I, I see no reason to get into that within the film itself, you know, just wait for the sequel. 
For the shots when he's uh, dangling by his hands, I partially disassembled him and uh, threaded a thick strand of wire through his sleeves and around his chest. Then I glued the ends of the wire to the portal hidden beneath his hands. And uh, those shots were animated sideways, so he was actually just like sticking out horizontally. So he takes his leap of faith and gravity writes itself, and uh, the solemn bursts through after him, but the light petrifies it. To achieve that effect, I painted it progressively between frames. Um, I'm kind of surprised I didn't get spots of paint on anything else. The whole final scene was the most difficult when it came to VFX. Fabricating the set piece was pretty straightforward, though. Uh, it mainly consists of a flat piece of wood with some steel attached to the ground for his magnetic feet. Uh, it's got some foam landscape trunks built up around the edges, and uh, some plastic plants glued down all over the place. What really gave me trouble though was when I brought everything into After Effects to apply the chroma key background and the light distortion. I rather ill-advisedly used a green screen uh, for the background here, because I thought the green light spilling onto the set would be consistent with the ambient light of the final version, but of course that meant the footage was full of holes because the chroma key effect kept removing all the plants. Shots like this close-up were particularly frustrating because the background has a blurry outline while Ainley's head has a cleaner outline. I had to get one of my friends to help me out with the chroma keying because she had a lot more experience with it than I do. And of course, once that was done, I had to apply the distortion effect. Uh, this was the actual worst. Like, this just blasted my Baja. It, it just about melted my computer every time I tried to open the file. I don't think I'll be able to adequately explain the process to anyone who isn't already familiar with this stuff. It basically involved cutting all these moving shapes out of the footage with a mask and then layering them over each other and moving them slightly out of alignment to get that refracted look. I also messed with the saturation and the tint of different layers. It took hours upon hours of trial and error to get it to look exactly right. Like, I had to strike that perfect balance between too much and too little. You know, it needs to be enough that you can tell that there's a weird distortion effect going on, but not so much that it's hard to focus on Ainley. So with the Solemn out of the way, uh, that's the final stage of the color script. Green is all that's left. Now the Solemn is blocking the way back, so Ainley's on the surface for good. The land here is covered in plants, so he'll survive, but it's still an alien world and unlike anything he's ever experienced before. Uh, the ending is slightly ambiguous, but when he throws away his knife at the end, uh, that tells us he's not afraid anymore. So he's lost the lantern, and now he's thrown away the knife, and that's the last thing he brought with him from underground. Oh my gosh, I forgot to remove the wire on his knife. No. Okay, so you'll have to forgive me for getting a little personal here. Uh, this was an art school project, so naturally it had to be about something more than just the literal text of the story, because that's how artists are. If you look at my upload history, you'll notice it's all basically the same thing. It's all just like dudes in suits fighting aliens or getting into various hijinks, shenanigans, and or tomfoolery, even antics sometimes. Growing up, pretty much all I wanted to do was animate fight scenes that take place in someone else's creation. Like, I was a good animator, sure, but I wasn't allowing myself to grow creatively or as a storyteller. Uh, and I never learned how to build sets and puppets because I just kept using Lego backgrounds and action figures. So while Ainley wanted to stay underground, I wanted to keep making videos about Halo and Metroid and Godzilla. While he kept looking for food in a place where it wouldn't naturally grow, I was looking for success as an animator while staying in worlds that someone else made. Uh, we both wanted to stay in our comfort zones, but then we'd never find what we needed. So in that way, this film is kind of about my own struggle with branching out and trying new things and living in the real world now that I'm done with college. Ainley had to leave the caves and live on the surface, and I have to leave my old hyperfixations behind and make something completely new. And also it would be nice to leave my parents' basement. I now realize I'm saying that with the Bionicle standing right in front of me. It would have been profound. You can just pretend it was. So while I worked on this film, I was like going on the same journey as Ainley. Simply by making it, I achieved what it said I had to do. I made a completely original film about how I have to make completely original films. It's like a self-fulfilling prophecy, I guess. It even kind of parallels the way this film started out as something like fan fiction for someone else's book, uh, Malice, uh, but eventually grew to be something else entirely. So about that sequel, you might have guessed that this isn't the end of Ainley's story. The depths, capital D, aren't really the depths, capital D, unless you can keep going deeper. There, there's a new world for him to explore now, and like I already have a much larger world and story in mind. Since before I finished working on this film, I was already making some concept sketches for future events. Hang on, that's not right. I, I, meant, I, meant, I meant to show you this. Please don't ask what that was. Uh, you'll notice that like the scale of this story and some of these environments are much more ambitious than anything I've done before. Uh, so I don't think I'll be able to pull it off on my own. Um, I could make some follow-up shorts every few years, but like who knows if or when I'll have the time. I mean, I still got to make The Last Colony Part 3 and you can see how long that's taking me. Ideally, this is something I could pitch to a larger production studio. 
Uh, it would be a dream come true to have this produced as a feature film or a short Netflix series or something like that. Also, I realize the risk I'm taking by showing off these like unfinished, unpublished concept drawings to the entire internet. But just know that if I see anything resembling any of this, I will find you. Also, look, I got any of these stickers on my sketchbook. How cute is that? I don't know how many of you are familiar with the movie Nine, but it's one of my favorites ever. Of note is that it began its life as a short film produced by a very small team, but it won some awards in a film festival and it got noticed by a bigger studio. And as a result, the director, Shane Acker, actually got to work on the feature film. That would honestly be best case scenario. Failing that though, I don't know, maybe I could like fund it on Kickstarter or something. But I would need more animators and fabricators and I don't know the first thing about running a studio. Plus, paying employees less than the value of their labor would violate my principles. Workers of the world rise up. So I guess just keep your fingers crossed and do what you can to help spread my work around. Do my advertising for me, you know. I know it's kind of a joke now, but the likes and comments really do help algorithm senpai notice me. If you want to go a little farther to support me, uh, there's always my Patreon. Or you could even pick up some merch from Teespring or Redbubble. If you want a shirt like this one, then go to Teespring because I have better prices there. Also, studies show that if you wear this shirt, you will become extremely hot. But if you want stickers or, uh, or masks or leggings or even a tasteful sundress, then you can go to Redbubble, which has a lot more variety. And if you want to help spread this stuff around or just, you know, stalk me, uh, you can also follow me on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. Uh, maybe not Twitter. I get political. On Twitter, workers of the world rise up. With that out of the way, I'd like to take a moment to thank everyone who offered me their support on Patreon. Okay, I'm re-recording this part because uh, my my list of patrons has changed dramatically since I recorded it the first time. So now it is time to mispronounce all of your names. It will be very exciting to hear your name spoken by my mouth. I'm very grateful for your support. Thank you. You are helping me eat. So that is a thank you to. Toa Ventrin, ah, Bionicle reference, a man of culture. Awesome Pants Films, I hope that means films about awesome pants because most of the pants I see in films are mediocre. Arboreal Squid, Vivian Cox, <laughs> Vivian. Uh, JP, Russ Bird, Asgore, Legionary. I'm assuming that's like a Warhammer reference. I'm not joining your cult. Um, Mascarades? Kyle Paulson, Caleb Fingston, Julie Garcia, hello, love you, Ellipsis, Leah and Josh Caruso, ah, my surrogate parents, uh, Ray Zefflin, B. Brennan, Tristan Vale, uh, Gun Nuts Films, uh, you, you, you may know him as the voice of Cal in The Last Colony, or, you know, uh, that guy who was making Megablocks Halo animations long before I ever happened, um, and finally, Peg Sullivan and Mike Bloom, my other surrogate parents. Thank you. Thank you so much. For those who don't know, my patrons get to see exclusive videos, sometimes they get behind-the-scenes content, uh, sometimes they get to see videos early. Um, for instance, uh, my patrons can see a rough cut of The Sky Below for quite a while before it was released. They also got to see early cuts of Pexaju vs. Godzilla, and when I start working on The Last Colony, they will see footage of that. Okay, goodbye everyone. I'll see you in a couple weeks, probably. I'm so tired. I love you. I know I was kind of making a big deal about The Sky Below underperforming before, but like, I want to make it clear how very thankful I am for the positive reception. I didn't expect so many of you to latch onto Ainley and become that attached to him. It was extremely heartwarming to see some of you like writing these whole analytical essays in my in my comments. It was just a very exciting time for me. Something like 130 of you guys attended the premiere. That was that was um that was just a lot of fun. I got to do stuff like that more often. Uh, okay, yeah. All right. I guess I'm done. I guess I'm done. There should be an end screen coming up now with, like, links and things. Um, I'm so sweaty right now. I wish I could turn on my AC, but it is very loud, and it would ruin the audio. Uh, so I, I'm just gonna suffer like this for a little while longer. Um, I'm not wearing pants. I'm not sure if you benefit from that information, but I couldn't stand being the only one who possesses it. Honestly, I like this thing a lot. I think it's cute. There's a bunch of other expressions of Ainley's face as well.